Hi friends, it's me, Rob, the Dungeon Tutor, here once again with another one of these kind of resume videos showing you what I have access to, the kind of games that I can just go to my shelf and talk about, which makes things a lot easier, honestly, but also to show off the kind of books that over the years I've gathered, considering them to be of value, considering them to be something that I want to talk about, or ones that I have played or want to play. And I think by knowing these kind of games, you kind of get a better sense for me, the person. Uh, and hopefully you gain some level of, um, let's just say, you determine that my advice might actually be useful. That I'm not some insane loony just sitting in a basement with a couple of, uh, you know, downloaded PDF books and cackling to myself as I profess that I have some perspective to help you with. So, <clears throat> anyhow... Fourth edition Dungeons and Dragons was a thing, wasn't it? Not the most popular of games, that's for sure. Uh, there was a very, very violent backlash against this game uh, by people who liked third edition and thought that Wizards of the Coast was insane for leaving third edition behind while it was still quite popular. And history kind of shows that to be true. This was the game that allowed another company for the first time to overshadow Dungeons & Dragons as the number one game that was being sold and possibly played. Although there were still a number of people who were playing 3rd edition. When 4th edition came out, it represented yet another change at Wizards of the Coast. The art direction changed into something a little bit more, less fine art, more cartoony I found. Um, not bad, certainly. Thematically, it's it was a different style. Um, and it wasn't bad. It just kind of highlighted what things were 3rd edition and what things weren't. Um, <clears throat> the organization and the layouts were excellent, as far as finding information was very good. But it didn't feel like Dungeons & Dragons anymore. It really felt, as the accusations rang out, that they had looked very long and very hard at massively multiplayer online role-playing games like World of Warcraft and thought, how can I bring some of the exciting elements that get millions of people playing it? Remember at this time, there was over 10 million people playing World of Warcraft. And how do I get them to come to our game and play on a regular basis? And some of the concepts that were in it did seem a little video gamey. For instance, the idea that you have powers that have a, a once an encounter use. So cooldowns, basically very much like something like a World of Warcraft. You have this power, but you can only use it once in a while. And when a new encounter starts up, bing, it unlocks so you can use it again. You have your at-will powers that you can use over and over again, and then the piece de la resistance, the daily power, which was a big stonking power that you just blasted and it did an extreme effect. Almost always combat-related. Uh, one of the major things with 4th edition that it was very focused on building encounters more so than spinning stories. So it was all about staging and uh, having monsters in the right roles and intelligently dissecting how to set up a challenging encounter, both in terms of the overall environment, uh, positioning for the monsters to make them more of a threat without having to necessarily just stick more powerful monsters on. And... No matter what you say about 4th edition, whether you liked it or you didn't like it, 4th edition was a really good system for teaching people how to build better encounters. I learned quite a bit from it myself. Although its sole reliance on encounters, it turned everything into an encounter. Even talking to somebody became a skill challenge instead of, but it was basically still an encounter. So that was okay. Um, I, and I think most people who ran 4th edition, kind of made a hybrid of it. We did some things according to the 4th edition sentimentalities, but some things we also drew on our other experiences to have more than just encounters and have more role play in it. So, uh, this of course is really tight in the slip cover, so I'm not going to take these books out, but by now you know these books. It's the Player's Handbook, the Dungeon Master's Guide, and the Monster Manual. These have stayed snugly in here for years. <laughs> because I haven't run 4th edition in a long time, nor does it look likely that I'm going to. Matter of fact, I was tempted to, at the next con I go to, run a 4th edition D&D game, just to see how many people signed it. I could use four hours of free time if nobody was interested. I thought it might be funny, actually. But no, um, it was 
it was very much disliked by a lot of the gaming community. Now, people who came into it, into Dungeons & Dragons at 4th edition, might still have some pretty fond memories of it, but even most of them have to admit that there were some key elements in the game that made it uncomfortable, especially if they got access to other games afterwards, like, say, 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons, and they go, oh, this is so much better. Some cases, that's true. I know there's still some people who play it, though, so that's cool. We'll give it the proper treatment. One of the headaches of... Uh, the game was its modular approach. It had multiple players' handbooks because they only had so much room. Each of the characters has a long list of powers and abilities. Even a... there's no trivial classes anymore. Every single one of them gets the same amount of stuff. And they have to cover everything from 1st to 30th level because that is the progression that you go through. From Paragon Tears... no. Heroic Tears, Paragon Tears, Epic Tears. Um... That is the path. And again, it kind of leads you to setting that structure up yourself, although the published adventures help. Um, <clears throat> so if you wanted to play some of the more beloved classes from 3rd edition, you had to buy these extra books. And this one featured Primal, Arcane, and Divine Heroes, for instance. There was a third player's handbook. By this time, 4th edition was dead and gone. Uh, it absolutely was a big impetus that killed one of my groups. Uh, it was the last thing, our, our, I think it was one of the last things my uh, my ladies group were, were doing, and they hated it. They did not like this game at all. I tried. I tried everything I could to make the game fun, but they just didn't like it. And in the end, it, it died. So, um, the, the other positive things I can say about it is uh, they they had a nice DM screen. It was a nice four-panel DM screen. I'm looking for nice things to say about it. Come on. I don't want to bash it. Um, the character sheets had a nice layout to them. They had, uh, you know, some nice things going on. But, uh, ones that I found to be absolutely important. Like 3rd edition, the acquisition of treasure and loot was kind of important uh, fourth edition, even more so. The understanding was that you were going to lean on magical items to give you a lot of your powers and abilities that you would use from time to time, and the Adventurer's Vault was crammed full of even more of them. One of the things that really made you notice that the, the, the atmosphere had changed completely in fourth edition was that the treasure tables were in the player's handbook. Not the DM's handbook to hand out to players as rewards anymore. The players had expectations that they would buy things right along with the skills that they would get. That, I don't think, was the right approach. And it wasn't replicated in 5th edition. <clears throat> but it just showed that the game was that much different. Uh, then I got the Forgotten Realms campaign guide. Posthumously, again, this... Most of the other books I have from this point on were all ones that I bought after 4th edition was dead, and I could get these at a reasonable price to mine for useful stuff. Um, the Forgotten Realms campaign guide, of course, I, as I said, this is the direction. At 3rd edition, they were already starting to think about shifting the focus of D&D &D from Greyhawk, which was Gary Gygax's old campaign, to Forgotten Realms, which is still being written about and vibrant and, and we're drawing a lot of people into D&D. &D. Uh, the stories of Drist from Salvatore and, and his band. And, uh, of course, Elminster uh, was a revered figure at Greenwood's personal insert. So, you know, that's that's the focus they chose to take. And again, the, the general approach from the main books was that, okay, this is a generic fantasy world, but we're going to drop in suggestions and hints about uh, the Forgotten Realms. That was the book that let you to have all the details. One of the things you'll notice is they did a very drastic paradigm shift with the world. Everything about D&D shifted in 4th edition. They created the Shadowfell and the Feywild as alternate uh, realms, dimensions outside of our own that could bleed into ours and, and, and alter and color things. That really wasn't so much of a thing in third edition and before they had the ethereal realm which was the closest that we had and then from there you could go to the elemental planes and stuff now that's just the elemental chaos it's not the air elemental uh, realm the earth elemental realm water zone um it's different it certainly is different uh i got the neverwinter campaign setting this i got 
<laughs> as much to talk about the stuff that was going on in the video game as I did about the uh, the role playing game. Uh, the video game, of course, is set in fourth edition, and there were some interesting things going on, interesting stories, and it's um, almost impossible to imagine that anybody would still be in Neverwinter for all of the bad stuff that goes on there that you need the players to to deal with. So, yeah, uh, the city is garbage. It's it's absolute garbage. But you know, it's a it's a rallying point. It's it's. I don't know. Um, the book isn't written too badly, but it's mostly lore. Not a great deal of, you know, hard numbers and stats. Underdark. I've never been a big fan of the Underdark. I don't... I think most adventurers choose to stay clear of the Underdark. But honestly, this book really kind of brought to light that there's a lot of good things in the Underdark. As much as, you know, it seems like it's an inhospitable place, if you think about the cities that are there and... Uh, some of the cultures, it's not just pure, uncompromising evil. Sure, you're going to have mind flayers, and you're going to have deep dragons, and you're going to have the Duergar and the Drow, of course. Um, yeah, that's true. And some of the environments can be very dangerous, but the above-ground ones can be pretty nasty, too, um, depending on the game you're going to run. So I found the Underdark to be... A pretty good book as far as opening my eyes to some of the positive encounters to the point where I wouldn't really have a problem with people playing an under our campaign at this point. Um, so, uh, as far as its total strength as a supplement, though, I never looked at it with enough depth uh, to want to, to, to be able to run it. Um, and if you notice, there's not a whole lot of 5th edition paths that take place in the Underdark. Spottedly go into it, but it's not like they did a deep delve adventure into that. So, Although eventually they're going to come up with the, uh, the Vault of the Spider Queen, some story about going up against Lolth. It's inevitable. I can't believe they haven't done it already. When they do that, I think that'll serve as that, that book. Um, player's Option, Heroes of Shadow. This is... I got this because it was dirt cheap, yeah, for five bucks. But what I got this for was purely opportunity, because looking through this, this has some very some of the examples of why fourth edition was really silly. Vampire is an adventuring class. You can train to be a better vampire. It's, I mean, you've got warlocks too, so you know you've got that. Um, and Warlocks have proven to be a pretty popular uh, class in 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. No problems, no arguments there. Uh, there are certain compelling things about them that I don't have a problem with. Um, you have Blackguards. Well, the Paladin Blackguard path has been one that was plowed through you know, years earlier in 3rd edition, so that's not even all that surprising either. So. But assassins and, uh, and again, vampires. Vampire just kind of threw me hard. And as a matter of fact, I didn't even notice it when I first got the book and thumbed through it. I didn't really pay attention to that. And that really, once I noticed that was in there, I'm like, this is just silliness. Silliness. But also, upon reflection, it's also an example of how Savage Species from 3rd Edition kind of changed our approach on how we could have characters that should be vastly more powerful, but have them level up into that awesome power along with their comrades. Kind of how that does. When you first level as a, as a vampire, you are a fledgling vampire. Uh, and if you, if you get up to 30th level, you are Strahd von Zerovich. You are Dracula. You are supremely powerful. So... It's a fun little splat book. And here's the weird thing, too. Because everything is kind of really well balanced in 4th edition, your vampire should be able to stand alongside of your wizards and your warlocks and your fighters and your rangers and your monks. And while there's some subtle power differences, because everybody is dragged to the same standard, it kind of works for balance. If balance is the altar you choose to sacrifice everything upon, I don't, so... Uh, we also have Halls of Undermountain. <clears throat> I've always been fascinated with Undermountain, one of the probably more well-known mega-dungeons in the actual D&D &D universe. 
Uh, of course, this is in the Forgotten Realms, Halster Black Cloak's uh, place. Uh, this I hated because this promises a mega dungeon, and it doesn't. It's just a series of encounters, one after the other after the other. Nothing of the great uh, undermountain, massive, sprawling complex. As a matter of fact, the map that's inside is relatively small. It's an encounter map. Not, not great. Not great at all. Um, they do have a more detailed map that is pretty big. But this is not what I would call, you know, Undermountain. It's, it's a big map. It's a big dungeon. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it isn't. But this book cannot support that kind of a dungeon. It has like 50 encounters, and that's about it. Eh, it's, it's okay. It's okay. The, the, the overall dungeon map is pretty cool, but it's, it's all right. Then, again, this is picking at the bones, but I got this book. The Shadowfell. This is not a book. This is a box set with cards and tokens and resources and stuff. Uh, it has a couple of books, it has a couple of maps, but the Shadowfell interested me because it tied to me an in really useful and interesting demiplane off of our reality. I thought that was actually a positive approach with the Feywild and the, and the Shadowfell kind of competing as this negative energy and positive energy that created odd things and explained a lot of the magic of the world in a way that was better than the cosmology of 3rd edition to me and my understanding. And I've continued to use the Shadowfell because I think it's really cool that there's kind of a mirror universe where everything is just dark and necrotic, and but you can still go there. And as living creatures, you can slip into the Shadowfell where the monsters can get more horrifying, but some characters might really have a good time in there. The characters that draw on holy power and such might do pretty well in the Shadowfell because their sacred flames and stuff mark them out as being different, but very powerful at the same time, even if they themselves aren't incredibly powerful by the standards of the normal realm. Uh, that faith, that, 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 that power might really challenge some of the existing powers that are in the Shadowfell. And uh, between that and playing through some of Neverwinter and times where you get to dip into the Shadowfell a little bit, it really changed my perspective on how you can approach these parallel dimensions and have adventuring opportunities in them. So all told, because I got this for next to nothing, and I'm looking for the Feywild book too, or the, the box set, um, actually pretty cool stuff, even if you may not like 4th edition very much. Some of the ideas that came out of it really weren't all that bad. And then, because again, I found these next and next to nothing, uh, I got the Rules Compendium, so I don't have to tote around those three books. This is enough to run the game. Um, digest form is kind of a neat idea for portability, and this does have everything that you pretty much need to understand the core rules of the game. It does not, however, it is not a complete replacement for the rest of the stuff because it does not have the full lists of all of the different classes and powers and abilities, which is really what 5th edition is all, or 4th edition is all about. So that is, that is the thing. But uh, I also have the Heroes of the Forgotten Kingdoms, which allows you to create and play druids, paladins, or rangers, and warlocks. So basically these are the player's handbooks, which are just focused on some pretty odd blends of, of classes and stuff. So if you've got this whole set, um, and I don't know how many of these uh, Essentials books they came out with, but it became a replacement for all of these hardcover books. Um, so that's my 4th edition stuff. As you can see, I did more than just dip my toe into it, and I ran a campaign in it, and uh, it was relatively short-lived because the players just would not buy into it. And I'll continue on with saying that I think 4th edition is a fine rule system. It's a decent game. It just should never have been the Dungeons & Dragons edition that it was. It would have been a fine Dungeons & Dragons tactics game, for instance. Um, but <clears throat> I'm glad I have it. I'm glad that I could look into it and see the evolution, what they were designing, what they were thinking would be a successful and viable new franchise. It's taught a lot of us a lesson, really, about what it takes to make a game these days. People had been making encounter-based games before, but when D&D &D did it, it just fell on its face. 
they shrunk the world down, they, uh, they kind of collapsed a lot of things on themselves, and cautionary tale. But that's 4th edition, and again, if you're interested, maybe even out of morbid curiosity or you know, wondering what can be pulled of use out of 4th edition, let me know. Comments below. Uh, I will happily go back through some of these books and uh, pull out some useful stuff and share it with everybody. And that is something that I will do in time, but if you want it faster, you have the control. Just let me know and I will work to satisfy uh, your curiosity. So, uh, thank you for joining me. Again, if you like this video, feel free to share, feel free to subscribe, feel free to, sh uh, you know, all the things. Uh, but mostly, comment below. Uh, maybe pass on some of your thoughts on 4th edition. For better or for worse, just keep it civil. Remember, even if you hated 4th edition, as some of my players did, some people really, really liked it. And, you know, we don't want to hurt feelings. Um... I don't believe in harshing other people's mellow or yucking other people's yums. Um, I try not to do it myself. Um, and I think in order to have good, intelligent conversations, we have to work hard at not doing that. So, um, but if you have any thoughts, any memories, feel free to share them with everyone. Uh, but until then, I'm Rob, the Dungeon Tutor. Thanks for joining me. And until that next time, farewell.